Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Flames turned their fortunes around just after the trade deadline. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to cover it and talk about if there's still playoff hope or not. So, Matt, let's jump right into this, shall we? Yeah, uh, it's uh, been an interesting week anyway. Last Monday was the trade deadline. We covered that. And then on uh, the Flames traveled to Toronto after that to play the Maple Leafs. Interesting fact, David Riddick traveled with the team to Toronto. Uh, only to you know go to a different dressing room when he got there. And if you watch the Toronto game, David Riddick started. He had a Toronto um, mask on, but still has Calgary pads, which I, I don't know why. I always find that funny when a goalie gets traded to a team with a completely different color scheme and you see them in you know blue pads in Calgary or you know green pads if they come from Minnesota or something like that. Yeah, and it was amusing after the game. Riddick said in the first period, uh, one of the Leafs players came like to get the puck off of him, and he panicked and shot the puck around the boards. And then he's like, "Oh, wait a minute, that's my team now." <laughs> you almost got to put duct tape or something over the pads. Yeah, it's like, oh yes, right, I'm on blue now. Yes, that's right. That yeah. <laughs> Um, well, this one, the Calgary Flames ended up winning against the Maple Leafs. So the, the Flames beat the top team in the league. We saw the same lines that we'd seen previously when they when Sutter had made his line change in effect here. And this did take an overtime win. It was 36 seconds into overtime. Da- um, Johnny Goudreau scored against his former teammate, David Riddick. And the Flames' goals came from Valimaki, who got his second, Lindholm, who got his 11th, and Goudreau got his 15th. So, Matt, overall thoughts on this one here? Well, it, it was a little bit more of a continuation of the Oilers game in that they were controlling the play a little bit more and playing more an identity style of game than we've seen. And they were easily able to keep up with Toronto. It, like, it wasn't like the past games against the Leafs where it was pretty much a turkey shoot and, oh, hey, we somehow managed to win because the goalie stood on his head. And, you know, it was a fairly good effort by the Flames, and I thought the two teams were fairly evenly matched throughout, which makes sense because it went to overtime. But Calgary held their own, and they managed to secure the win. Yeah, I, I think you, you said it well there, that this did feel like a continuation of the Edmonton game. A lot of the good things we saw from the Flames, and that Edmonton game wasn't perfect by any stretch of imagination, but the good things that we did see in that game, I think we saw, like you said, a lot of them coming back here and the Flames playing to their identity, playing the way that we know they can play. And I I think this was, especially against the top team in the league, I think this was probably a very uh, needed win and needed good play for this team just to show that they can do this and they can take on a a team like that. Yeah, and... If Calgary is going to have any chances at all of being more than a lottery pick team, they just need to play like that, period. And like, if they're playing in a similar mode to that, they will do their end of the homework that they need to do the rest of the way and then hope that Montreal has some bad times ahead if they want to make the playoffs. And it's they did what they needed to do and Calgary it's been basically the first time all season where they actually look like they should have from the get-go just as a note here this game on Tuesday was Milan Lucic's thousandth game so obviously a guy who's been around the league for a while and a and a veteran here on this team um, he's had an up and down season, but who hasn't here? But nice to see a guy like Luch, and they—I would say—they really put on a show for a guy like Luch, who's maybe not the, you know, the top player on our team. Um, but the Flames did a good job through social media and their own website and things like that to really put on a show here for Luch, and I thought that was well done. So good job to the Calgary Flames, and congratulations to Milan Lucic for a thousand games. Yeah, and he's been one of the Flames' best players this season and most consistent players. Yeah, so it was very well done, and I'm glad that he managed to rack up this 1,000th game. And then the next night, the Flames went to Montreal, uh, not that far of travel, which is nice, and took on the 
uh, Montreal Canadiens and Lucic, I guess, 1,000th and 1th game, which nobody gives you credit for playing that next one. And again, big Flames win here. 4-1 to one win over the Canadian. Uh Giordano had a goal and assist in this one, and the Flames goals came from Hannafin, his 4th, Gio's 8th. Uh, Josh Levo's fifth and Sean Monahan's ninth. And, you know, I, I'm going to say this, but even Joachim Nordstrom looked good in this one. Like, this is another game where I think, as you were saying, I thought the Flames played a really good game, played within their system, and, um, you know, showed that good things can happen when you play the game correctly. Yeah, and I think that, like, for a good portion of the first, well, 40-ish games of the season – the Flames really did not look like a team that had any particular direction to with any of the players on the team, and that everybody was kind of on their own page. And, like, for the last three games, four games, uh, including the next one, it's been the first time where you've seen this team actually pulling in the same direction and doing the things that they actually need to do in order to earn the two points. And... You know, it's a lot of little things, and this team's just been kind of all over themselves, all over the place, and not able to get any cohesion until, really, the last week in a, and one game. Yeah, no, I think that's that's well said. Now that they have that cohesion, they're I mean, these guys are now showing I think what they can do when they play well. And you've you've talked about it, I've talked about it, you know, all Calgary media's talked about it, but this team is better on paper than they are on the ice. But these two yeah. games and even that Edmonton game, I think, show what this team can do when they're playing the way they should be for sixty minutes. Yeah, and like that's why like in my season preview predictions and all of that, like I was basing it off of the talent level of this team and like this is what more of like what I was referring to. It's just that for whatever reason, things just were not working at all. And, you know, the season unfolded as it did, but you know, the very much the same talent level is there that the flames had in that 107 point season. It's just now getting everybody on the same page. So they're pulling more, together like they were that season and you know if that's the case then the results will come whether it's too little too late or not yet to be seen well as i was just about to say it may be too little too late by the time those results come but i mean it shows that these guys can do it and you know it, it's just a matter of figuring out how to get that out of them again next year well, the Flames played Montreal again on Friday, so they got a couple days, uh, one-day break here. From Wednesday, they had uh, Thursday off, and then they played Friday against Montreal in Montreal again. And this one, uh, the Flames did not win. They ended up losing 2-1 to one in Montreal. I thought in this one, the Flames, I thought it was a great game for the Flames. They had a lot of chances in the second, and I thought um, a lot of chances in general in that game that really made... Not only goal chances, but just, I guess, the way they're playing the game. But I thought the Flames deserved to win this one. They got a lot of chances in the second. They played tight. Um, I, I thought they probably deserved this win over over Montreal. Yeah, I think if this one, if you play this game eight or nine times, the Flames probably, or ten times, the Flames probably win eight or nine of them. It's just, unfortunately, some bad luck happened you know, like when you hit the post solidly three times. Well, that's it. What three three shots in a row in the second there? You know, like it, like if any of those go in, the Flames have one more point that at least in the standings, and if not two, and are that much closer. So, you know, like it, if they had managed to get one bounce, like the Flames might only be like four points down or five points down, not. You know, it just really unfortunate, and it happens, but, you know, it it's basically the last time that this team can give up a win to Montreal, and they just really need to pull up their socks the rest of the way against them. And, you know, I, I think the big question to me here is going to be, how does this team respond from that unlucky win? I mean, when they play Ottawa, and we'll talk about next week coming up, but when they play Ottawa on Monday, tomorrow, do they 
go into that one still riding high like they have since the Edmonton game, or do they end up, you know, kind of falling apart again and, and losing their confidence? And I think that's really going to be the question coming out of this week. Well, and that's the key to the flame season. Like, have they matured? And yeah, and they don't, but they don't tend to respond well after a loss. No, and exactly. And, like, they're playing a loser team in Ottawa. But, they're, <laughs> but they're a last... loser team that's had their number all season. Yeah, I know. That's neither here nor there. Like, they're a bad team. And so the Flames should get the two points. Just like they should have every time we played Ottawa this season, pretty much. But, you know, it, it, stuff happens. But, like, they should. Like, if they're acting in a mature manner, and there is a difference with how they're playing now versus, you know, like, ten days ago, then they'll beat Ottawa handily and carry on to the next one. And like, you'll see, like, is there a difference or is it just that they had a good week? And in which case, you know, if they had a good week, well, we're still looking at like the eighth ish overall pick and who cares? But, you know, and like all of the discussion of last week of trading so-and-so and so-and-so in the off season and all that is valid. If this team has actually turned a corner and is the mature, you know, giving a good effort each game, playing 60 minutes each game team, it'll become very evident very fast. And, you know, then it, more likely it will be on Montreal to you know, not lose their way out of a playoff spot. Well, let's Calgary come back will to be that, doing Matt. their work. Let's, yeah, talk about, let's finish this week and then let's talk about what we need to do and what Montreal needs to do. But let's just f wrap up this week. And I agree with you. I think it's going to be, is it a flash in the pan week? Or is it, you know, Calgary's yeah. turned some, sign, some sort of a corner? And I think that's what we'll see this week with the three games that we play, one against Ottawa, two against Montreal. Um, but we'll talk more about what it's going to take to make it in just a second. Let's wrap up this week looking at the stats. We still sit fifth in the Scotia North Division with 41 points and 44 games played. Montreal is 42 games played. So they have two games at hand, and they're at 47 points, six points up on us. Uh, Vancouver no longer really chasing us, and I don't think – I mean, you and I had talked in the past about maybe Vancouver's a threat there, but they have 37 games and 35 points. I think with the COVID stuff, they're not going to – they're out of this yeah. one now. So it's really down to Calgary and Montreal – um, for that fourth spot. But before we talk about making the playoffs, Matt, what do you think caused Calgary's turnaround this week? Do you think it was the line changes? Do you think maybe it was that sort of feeling that nobody's invincible and we saw two core pieces of this team move? Um, do you think it's finally just they've had enough time to get Daryl Sutter's message into their heads? What do you think caused this week to look very different for the Flames? Well, you know, there was a if I recall correctly, an article that basically referred to the Flames as, like, the Buffalo Sabres of the West. And, you know, like, if, you know, I was Daryl and trying to motivate this team, like, I would be making sure, like, any mention like that would be posted in the dressing room. It, to, like, this is what everybody thinks of you people. And you can change how that perception on the ice go to it and i think that like especially with how like the flames had to sell at the deadline and all of that that you know like it it really does hit you in the face that hey you know we suck <laughs> you know as a group and but yet the talent level is not the problem. It's what our execution of the game plan that's the problem. And I think that this last bit has been a lot of hey, you know, you know, because you look at guys, all of the guys on the team, like because you look at say Buffalo, like if you're looking at Jack Eichel individually he's a good player but he's going to not return what jack eichel should in a trade just due to the fact that 
he has that legacy of being a saber and like you're you kind of get tainted by your team a bit and you you saw that with some of the trades that edmonton had made like the everly trade like the hall trade where they didn't get nearly enough for those players because there was a perception that oh well if you're playing for that team you're a lousy player and all of the players on the Flames currently are have earned themselves that kind of a reputation of, you know, you you burn through coaches left, right, and center, you don't listen, and you don't give any effort consistently. So what changed in the last week, man? I think that that message finally is hitting home that, oh, well, if we want to have an actual career beyond this season or the next cup like this next contract whenever it ends and th that goes for everybody on this team that you have to actually pull up your socks and you know you're you have to actually get hungry to actually want to earn a paycheck beyond the one that you're currently getting because a bunch of the players on the flames frankly don't really deserve another contract in the nhl but why wouldn't you i guess why now though why wouldn't you have thought of that six weeks ago I think the immediacy of the trade deadline and seeing two of the, your friends getting dealt kind of really smacks you in the face. <laughs> I, I think you're right, and I think it's the first year that Calgary has gone out of the deadline and said, we're not in this by making trades. Usually we're bringing guys yeah. in and trying to make some out of it, and I think we have a core that's been here for a while, and I think – uh, this this might sound wrong, but I think complacency factors a lot into that. We'll yeah. just do what we always do, and you know maybe we'll squeak in. But I think the management coming out and saying we're moving two key pieces: our good goaltender and Sam Bennett, who's the highest pick in franchise history and has been here forever. Um, I, I think that that probably says some of the players that you know what change is starting, and I think maybe that gave the guys a yeah. bit of a kick in the butt. Yeah, and plus it's a direct shot from the management of well, hey. You guys have sucked, so we're making changes, period. And, and, and I think there's – and sort of like you were saying about guys with a new contract, I think a lot of this now is, wow, I could be next. I could be out of here at the end of the season, but I think you're right. It's the immediacy of trade deadline that, that you know, kick these guys in a gear. Yeah. And whether uh, or not that solved everything or not will well, three, play out. Three games a small sample size. We'll see how the next week plays out. Exactly. And, you know, like we could be talking this time next week about how, oh, the Flames won three or four games. I, I'm not really sure three, how many we played. Three games. Three. You know, oh, we won all three games and Montreal lost two of them, so we're back even. And, you know, like we're right in a playoff push now. Or, okay, yeah, which pick are we getting? Mm hmm. You know, and that's basically where our conversation, it's going to be one or the other. Like, the it's either we're done or we're in it and that'll be on the players entirely and you know if the the team can actually pull it together and play on that same page the talent level is there where they should beat most of these teams and like it, with the 12 games remaining if they play like this every game they could easily win 10 of them well, it, well, yeah, you know, if they it, play it, like this, but we get back to Matt, if they could play like this, we wouldn't be where we were. No, and where we and, are. And, and, and I know, but that's where, like, has something changed or is it just an immediate response to some bad news? And, like, if it's just a reaction to bad news, then the Flames probably lose tomorrow against Ottawa and probably drop one of the other games this week and like uh, we're literally talking about who's in the draft next next episode <laughs> well with the flames of 12 games left as you've mentioned uh the canadians have 14 if we break down those schedules calgary plays edmonton twice montreal three times ottawa twice vancouver twice potentially more depending on what happens with those games and winnipeg once uh, the Canadians have 14 games left. They play us three times, Edmonton four times, Ottawa twice, Toronto twice, Winnipeg once. Um, so really, if you if you look at some scenarios here, 
Um, and this all comes from Flames Nation. Ryan Pike, friend of the show, put all this together. But just going through kind of a few scenarios here. Uh, if Montreal goes 500 in their remaining games, that would trim Calgary's tragic number down to 2.5, which means the Flames would be eliminated if they lost just two games. Bear in mind that the Habs are 560 over the first 42 games of the season, which means they're just barely doing better than winning half the games. What if Calgary wins half the games? And Matt, I think right now, I mean, you know, you say they, they could win 10. I think that's going to be tough. I think 500 would probably be the best, knowing what we know about this team already. I think 500 would be the best they're going to do down the stretch. Well, if the this team performs up to the expectations of how they've played this season, winning five or six of the games out of the 12 is about right. You know, because the quality of the Flames' opponents, they're playing a lot of mediocrity, frankly. So, and if the Flames do go 500, that would trim the tragic number down to 3.5, which means the Flames would be eliminated if Montreal won four times in the remaining 14 games. Bear in mind, the Flames are sub-500 team over the first 44. So you're right. Calgary, if you look at the schedule, has a better chance probably of getting that 500 mark than Montreal does. Yeah, and, well, looking at the schedule like 75 percent of the games are against the weaker three teams in our division so like nine of the 12 if the flames are playing the way that they were in the three games that they won um prior to the last loss they should probably win seven or eight of those if that level of play continues it, just because you're playing lesser opponents, you should beat them. And then it's just, uh, you know, Edmonton, Winnipeg, can you beat them? And it, it's one of those things that this team has never really fared well when they're desperate. It Like, they haven't been able to find that second gear. And frankly, the last four games is the first time I've even seen a hint of that second gear. And it's one of those things where, like, if the Flames can get a little bit of a run going and, say, Montreal struggles a bit because they're playing a lot of really good teams, like, nine of their remaining 14 are against the three good playoff teams. So, like, it's going to be naturally harder for them to win those just because, you know, like, <laughs> they're good <laughs> versus, you know, the majority of the teams that we're playing. So... It's one of those weird situations where could Calgary do it? Possibly. Could Montreal lose it? Possibly. It's basically if the Flames make the playoffs, the situation in terms of the schedule and all that is basically tailor made for the Flames to make that comeback. But that means that you actually have to go out and do the work, which has been the problem for years. <laughs> so, the biggest advantage, I think, for the Flames going forward is they... Tell me if you would agree with this, but they've looked better when they've had a couple days break, especially under Sutter, when they can refocus and clean up their game. They, they've they looked better since Daryl came in. I mean, even that Edmonton game, right? They had four days before that. Um, at the end of March, they had, what, three days? Like, they've always looked better when they've come back from a break. Yeah, I agree. And if you look at the schedule from here on out, today's the 18th. They play on the 19th. Then they get a three-day break. Then they have a back-to-back. -back, then they uh, get one day off, play on the 26th, and they get a two-day break. Then they get uh, Edmonton, and then they have... Um, uh, after the, the second Edmonton game on the first, they have a three day break, second, third, and fourth. Then they get a three day break for Ottawa and then potentially a three day break for the last games in, uh, against Vancouver. So really, I mean, this team has a ton of longer breaks here. And I think if they're going to do this and if they're going to be able to get anywhere close to where Montreal is and sustain that pressure, I think the biggest thing for these guys is going to be to use those breaks the way that they have and the way that Daryl has and really tighten up their game, maybe change up the lines or do whatever they have to do during that time to sort of keep themselves sharp. And and we've seen Daryl do that well with this team. Yeah, and plus like, there's enough rest in there that marks from, like even though like there's 12 games left, like he's not going to get burnt by him playing all 12. 
And, like, at this point, like, until the flames are basically out, I think you just run Markstrom until the wheels fall off. Even in the back-to-backs? Yeah, might as well. Um, No other option at this point. Like, normally you'd throw Riddick in one of them, but at this point, you just run Markstrom until you're out. And... Then, you know, who gives, you know. Like we talked the, about that last week, right? When we're out, start playing the younger goalies. But yeah. Yeah, and, and there's pros and cons to that. I mean, I don't disagree with you. But at the same time, if you run Markstrom, is he going to be ready for the playoffs? And looking at the other teams in the playoffs, I think everybody except for Winnipeg has a better backup than we do. Um, I think that Domingue and Brassoir are about at the same level. But, you know, what do you do if, let's say, you run Markstrom? I guess it's a catch-22, right? It's, it, you, you know, it's six of one, half dozen the other. But what if he gets hurt going to the playoffs? You're done. Well, put it this way. If the Flames make the playoffs, that's an achievement in themselves. So, like, the Flames basically, it, they're, the pressure's off of Calgary. Everybody's written them off as a bunch of losers. They're six points out of a playoff spot. So, like, if they manage to get there, it's like, oh, hey, Calgary actually got here. Wow, that's a shock. And, like, they're not gonna... They're gonna... Like, everybody's gonna say, oh, Toronto in four games. I'm assuming Toronto wins the division in this scenario. But, you know, like, it's one of those things that... Like, Calgary will have zero expectations. So if they lose in the first round of Toronto, it's like, yeah, okay, sure, makes sense. And, you know, it puts all the pressure on Toronto to beat us if we actually get there. Again, doubtful, but, you know, it, it's one of those things that, like, if Markstrom's beat up by the time we get to the playoffs, it's kind of like, yeah, but we actually got there. So Yeah, you're, you're thinking it's, it's better to rely on them at least get there then yeah. rest them and not get there in hopes that maybe we'll need them down the road. And I, I would agree with you there. Yeah, because, like, regardless, the, the the off season's long. <laughs> so, you know, like, if the Flames miss the playoffs or, you know, we make it and we're out in five games, say, against Toronto, well, Markstrom's going to have a long time to recover anyway, so... And I still think there's something wrong with him, so his road to recovery might be a little bit... Uh, longer with I think he's going to need surgery on something yeah it, it's one of those things that we'll see it, it, it's like this is a lot of assuming and hypotheticals so uh, like the odds that this is even a discussion like a week from now I think is slim <laughs> so you know if it, it is an actual thing to talk about a week or two from now then hey that that's awesome <laughs> but We'll see. We've seen over the last week, and I think one of the things that also has helped with the success was some changes to the lines. And just to remind everybody what the lines have been. Uh, the first line, quote unquote, was Goudreau, Lindholm, Kachuk. Kachuk on right wing there. Mongepani, Monahan, and Dubé on the second line. And Daryl Sutter went and told Sean that he's the veteran anchor in that line and giving Monahan some more responsibility there. Third line being Lucic, Backlund, and Nordstrom. Fourth line is Levo, Ryan, and Richie. The defensive pairs, Giordano and Tanev, Noah Hannafin and Rasmus Anderson. And again, um, from what I understand, Hannafin's been told he's the he's the veteran on that pairing. It's his pairing, quote-unquote. It's the Hannafin pair. Uh, Valimaki and Stone is the third pair. Matt, you, you and I talked about this last week of keeping those lines until they don't work anymore. Well, one could argue that they, you know, they didn't work because we didn't get the win against Montreal. Would you do any further tweaks to this lineup right now? I'd pretty much let it rip. Like, the Flames really should have won that game. So, like, if you're going to make a tweak, it would probably be something in the depth-ish zone. or Moving you know, Nordstrom down and Richie up, something like that. Yeah, like, an irrelevant-ish thing like that. Like, yeah, I wouldn't expect it to be anything more major. It's, I think one of the big storylines from here on out is going to be how Johnny, and let's assume these lines last till the end of the season, how Johnny and Monahan, Johnny and Monty, um, fair being apart. They've been together most of their career together and look great together. But if we're getting great production from, you know, Goudreau Lindholm 
and Kachuk on that first line, maybe there's something to be tried out there next year if both guys stay. Yeah, and um, it, this will allow the team to also get more of an idea of, like, do, do you actually keep Gaudreau, et cetera, et cetera, and make smaller tweaks and hope that just, like, everybody being healthy and, like, adding certain small things. Because you have to remember that losing Bennett and uh, Ryan right. and Riddick, that's, like, nearly $8 million in salary. Mm -hmm. You can get a really good second-line winger for that. You can get and, a first line and, winger for almost eight million. Yeah, and still have money to get a backup and you know, f like fill internally those other spots. So, like it, it's we're going to get an improvement to the roster regardless, just from reallocating cap. So it, it's you know, like do you need to make those moves? And I think that's a large part of what the last 12 games that will be is do these players actually want to be here yep and that will be evident in their play like if they're giving it their all it doesn't really matter if they come up short if they're putting it all out there and you know leaving it all on the field and hey we didn't have quite enough because we started a little too late oh well at least you showed that you gave a crap, <laughs> which up until this point, not so much. And, you know, it, with all of these things, it gives the management like a whole li list of different permutations for how this off season and moving this team forward will be. And well, I, th I think it also lets you evaluate Goudreau Monahan individually now a little bit better than you could before as well. Mm -hmm. The only thing I might change in this lineup here um, is I think that it were still a little top heavy and you and I have talked about that earlier in the season of, you know, having one really good line. I might switch this out if we're, you know, if we're down or not if we're down, if we're up in a game and we've got some, you know, some lead that we're willing to gamble with a little bit would be to have uh, Goudreau, Lindholm, Dubé as the first line, Mongepani, Monahan, and Kachuk as the second line. And I think really if you're going to go forward with this core and you had an interesting point there, what you're just saying of, you know, should we trade Goudreau? I think that this lineup is not sustainable going forward. You need that second line right winger, as we've talked about. But I think if you could break this team up into essentially Goudreau, Lindholm, Monaghan, Kachuk, I think you have the makings of two really good lines there. Yeah. I, I mean, agree. You're, you're out, and it could either be Dubé or Mangiapane, but I think moving one of those guys to the top line and then moving Kachuk down, either on the left or the right, I think gives you a little more balance and also a little different style. I think that, you know, Kachuk and Monaghan, I've, I've thought for a while that those two would have a good style together. Um, I think Goudreau and Lindholm are working out well, but maybe we can start building some new chemistry. Yeah, and I think that as this team moves forward, they're going to have to figure out different permutations to get the effects that they're looking for yeah and, and you know we've talked about this earlier in the season and i won't harp on it too much here but in this version of the calgary flames now michael backland becomes your third line center and you were talking about freeing up eight million dollars five plus million for a third line center is a lot of money to spend there i still think backland might be the guy that if you're going to keep this core Backlund might be the guy you got to move out just to free some money. And, and there are all sorts of different permutations. Like, that's why, like, it's hard at this stage to see exactly who, what, and how um, for what we're looking at. Because it's, yeah, it, it's still too early, uh, you know, um... Because, like, if the Flames, say, fall flat on their face in the next week or, or two and, like, everything, you know, goes right down the toilet, well, then, you know, you're looking at, like, whole scale, wholesale changes to a whole bunch of the team. And, you know, it, 
yet if they actually pull it together and make the playoffs or come close, that's a whole different ball game. So it's still way too much up in the air right now. I think that if you're trying to get, you know, a first or second line right wing, and you were saying earlier, you know, eight million's a lot to play with. But I think there might just be something to to be said about reallocating some of that fun from the third, you know, the third line centerman to uh, you know, maybe two top six right wingers. But we'll we'll see what happens in the offseason. I, I think the backlink's still a useful piece here, but I think the teams are gonna get more and more conscious about how they're spending their dollars in the flat cap era. So we'll we'll see what they end up doing with that money. Um, Matt, I think from there we that's probably about it for the week that was for the Calgary Flames in terms of on ice. Any other story from this week that you want to chat about? Uh, not really. Uh, it's just we're in this wait and see mode, frankly, and it, you know it'll be an interesting week of Flames hockey, at least probably the most interesting in a long time, and we'll have a lot of final verdicts I think in a lot of ways it, like, especially if it goes badly if <laughs> you know um, that on this team if things go awry and you, you think that Brad Living starts the hawking after this star players get your star players here pretty much pretty much I, I, I think that like if the I think uh, that this trade deadline, what frankly, was a lot of uh, groundwork for the draft and you know setting up trades like well, post expansion draft and all that. Cr- yeah, kind of and, stuff. Yeah, and I, I think you just hit on a key piece there. I think there's going to be teams that are going to lose a guy in the expansion draft and then go out and want to acquire somebody quickly. So I think that you might see the Goudreau trade or the Monahan trade or whatever they end up doing here. Um, be sort of after the expansion draft once we know who's got what. Mm-hmm. And if if Seattle thinks they can be competitive, I wonder if Seattle could end up being the destination there too of trying to pick up a you know a big name to try and make a run. Yeah, uh, it depends if they possible. expect that they're going to be Vegas or if they expect to be a traditional expansion team. Yeah, and we don't know that yet. Yep. Well, we have some transactions we should talk about. Not as exciting as what we have talked about, but uh, first one is Tyler Parsons is back. He hasn't played a game yet this season. Tyler Parsons has been out uh, injured. We know he's had some problems in the past, some mental health issues and other injuries. And um, last year he played the whole year in the ECHL, but he's back in Stockton. Matt, at one point you and I both thought Parsons could be sort of the next big goalie for the Flames. Do you think that ship has sailed at this point? Uh, it, n- never say never, but that window is quickly dwindling, and it's sort of like when Gillies came back from the, his year-long injury, it's like, okay, um, are you going to do anything, uh, come I think on. the biggest, the biggest knock on Parsons is he hasn't played a full season since turning pro. Yeah, and that's where it's like, okay, well, you know... Let's go. Like, if you're putting the results forward, then, you know, that's one thing. But, like, he's but if you're kind gonna, of... I think if it, you're going to invest in a guy at the NHL level, especially as a backup, you need to make sure that guy's ready. If your backup's always hurt, he does you no good. Yeah, exactly. And, it, like, I think that you're bas- you need to basically treat Parsons as if he's just a uh, long-term project type guy and you know like i'd keep him around for like another contract for like a year or two uh and like let him give him the runway to figure things out and then cut bait after that one if he doesn't turn out and i think that you kind of have to look at uh david wolf uh dustin wolf um as the like goalie of the future for now and uh parsons is the well maybe guy and and you know and you and i've talked about it. there's guys that make a, a good living playing ahl ECHL hockey for their career and i think whether here or somewhere else i think dustin or sorry uh, you, you're mentioning wolf i think that tyler parsons can make a decent career playing in the ahl or echl he's good enough to be there 
but I don't think this guy is your next. You know, I don't think that you get rid of Riddick and you go, all right, Parsons is our backup next year, kind of by default. Yeah, no. But you're right. I think no. I think Wolf is the guy to look at at this point, and Parsons is what he is. But I think we've kind of we have a nice a sense of what he is at this point. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I mean, like you said, good, nice guy. You and I have talked to him a few times. Uh, good guy to have around the organization. Six foot one, bigger goalie, but I think. At this point, his ceiling is probably, you know, your emergency number two. Otherwise, he's probably a, a career AHL, ECHL, European goalie. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, he might do well. I mean, I'm looking at his stats here. He's played, you know, pretty much 20 games every year. Uh, 28 in, uh, well, 28 in the ECHL, 7 that year in Stockton. 20 last year, 25 uh, one year. I think he could do well in a league that is a shorter season, you know, like one of the European leagues that's playing, uh, you know, 35, 40 games. He might do well over there, but I, it just seems like he can't handle the North American workload. Yeah. We'll see. And um, as an AHL backup, I mean, if you bring Wolf in and you're relying on him to play 20 games, I think he can do that. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see at one way or the other. Like, this team... You know, like, I, I think that they're still going to need to add another goalie and add another goalie and add another goalie, like, every year, basically, yeah. until they get, you know. And, cause... and Wolf, Wolf looks good, but he's a few years away from being NHL ready. You don't want to push him up next year. So I think that they're going to have to go free agent shopping, even if just for one year, sort of like they did with Talbot, just to firm up the backup role. Yeah, and it's like, even, um, look, it, it, depending on how the flame season ends up like it, getting Wallstead in the draft might not be a bad option as well but even then you're probably it. not taking that guy and turn him pro you know the next year to play back oh no 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 you know you bring that guy in if you're going to turn him pro you bring him you know bring him to the hl and give him minutes but you don't turn a guy pro bring him to the hl and have him play 20 games behind you know a, yeah. a star no, no, like no. markstrom no, and Wallstead is probably like three or four years away as well. But yeah, you know, I it's always worry about like first it, round first round draft pick goalies though. They never seem to turn out the way they should. Uh, that's getting a little less the case. Like in like from like 2005 through like 2015, that was very much the case. But it's gotten a little bit better lately. And you know, Calgary's done well with finding goalies in Europe. I mean. I'm not saying Zaga Doolin's the guy. I'm not sold on him yet either, but maybe they bring in a guy from Europe to play that backup role and, you know, save some money that way, bringing the guy over cheap from Europe. Yeah. And that's entirely possible too. Like there's so many permutations right now that it, we just have to kind of wait and see on that. Cause there's, yeah, like it, it's, yeah, like the Flames have plenty of options pretty much no matter which way you cut it. And then we had four players assigned, three players assigned to Stockton from the taxi squad. Alec Petrovic, Adam Rajishka both sent back to Stockton. And surprisingly, Dominique Simone also sent uh, from the taxi squad to the AHL. You know, Matt, we brought in him, we brought in Nordstrom, we brought in uh, Levo at the beginning of the season, and, and I'm not saying it's just those three. I mean, this whole season hasn't worked out for the Flames, but when was the last time you brought in three guys and none of them worked out? I know. It's one of those odd things where, like, basically anybody that they've tried out has been kind of bland or bad <laughs> outright, and... You know, like, I was expecting Simon to be kind of like a Toby Reader-ish guy. Not necessarily as fast, but, you know, something. And, yeah, I think that it says was... something about the coach, too. I mean, when you look at Brett Ritchie, Brett Ritchie's very much a Daryl Sutter player, and he's stayed up here. I mean, he, he wasn't here all season, but he's found a... Looks like a regular spot on the team, and Dominique Simone hasn't. And with... You know, with the change of coaches, that really doesn't surprise me. No, and like Richie, at a minimum, can throw a hit, and same with Nordstrom. So, like it, it being Simon that goes away it makes total sense. 
And then uh, Justin Kirkland was recalled from Stockton to the taxi squad. So at this point, Calgary's taxi squad is Oliver Shillington, Zach Ronaldo, Artyom Zagadulin, and Justin Kirkland. That's Those are the four players currently on our taxi squad. Yeah. Um, Ronaldo, I mean, again, Ronaldo's a guy that can... Uh, we've seen him be useful here. He's He's been a useful player. He can throw a hit. I think that makes sense. Kirkland, well, yeah, okay. He's sort of like the Buddy Robinson of the past where he's a good enough tweener guy that he can fit in for one or two games. Everyone's keeping a goalie on their taxi squad. And again, all things considered, Zaga Doolin's the right goalie because right now he's uh, the number three because Domingue's the number two. And mm. Shillington, well, yeah, that's the obvious choice in defense. So so the taxi squad as it sits, I think, is probably the best use of that taxi squad, especially with Stockton having a pretty good season. I think it also makes sense to send Simone down there to try and help out with the offense. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, uh, an NHL guy, a veteran guy, you can probably help them out a little bit. Yeah. Well, that, that brings to the, to the end this last week for the Flames. The week of hope, we'll call it. And we'll see if the week of hope rolls on as we move into the next week, which is all home games. The Flames play four home games in a row uh, here at the Saddle Dome. And tomorrow night, Monday night, is against the Ottawa Senators, a 7 p.m. start time, a proper time for a hockey game, not this 4 o'clock in the afternoon crap that we've been having. Um, then the Flames get three days off, and then they'll play Friday, Saturday, so a back-to-back there. 7 p.m. on Friday, and then the early game for Hockey Night in Canada on Saturday, both of those against the Montreal Canadiens. So, Matt, we got three games queued up for this week. What are you thinking? Well, realistically, there is no other option. They need 3-0. Uh, that's literally, there is no other option. They absolutely must win all three. Is this the week, do you think, that's make or break? Like, we've said that for a couple weeks, but looking at the schedule, if they don't, you know, if they don't win two this week. Like, okay, if I, they don't win both against Montreal, they're done. Like well, they, I would they, say I would say those two and the game on the 26th, three of the next four against Montreal. I think you've yeah. got to do two of those three. I, I I frankly I think that they pretty much need to win all three if they want to, because like it becomes extremely hard if they lose any of those games to Montreal. And there's some like, games here we don't even know what's going to happen with with the Vancouver games. I wouldn't be surprised. You and I talked about this for the show if Calgary and Vancouver are out if we just don't play them. Yeah, well, like it, you look at um, the uh, games against Montreal, like. If Calgary wins all three of them, then Montreal basically then has just the two games in hand and we have the tiebreaker and we're even with them. So like that's where like why it is absolutely vital that they win those three games. Like that if they don't then Montreal has a minimum of a four point lead and and the games in hand and like then you're requiring even more help and it re- basically removes your ability to even remotely control your own destiny at that point you're hoping that Toronto and Edmonton are just murdering Montreal at every opportunity and while those teams might actually do that you're not doing yourself any favors. So, like, you really need to do your own homework here, and the Flames need to win all three against Montreal out of the next four games. Like, the Ottawa game, they need to win it, but if you're going to lose one, that's kind of the okay one if they win the the next three. That's the important thing. I hate to say it. I think I'm going to be optimistic, but not as optimistic as you. I think we have a loss and then two wins. We have not done well against the Senators this year. And I think that curse is going to continue tomorrow night against Ottawa. Um, I think they'll lose that. And then I think that they see, I, I, I never confident on a back to back, but I think they have to find a way. Yeah. So I'm going to go loss and then two wins. Yeah. Well, it, they've basically run out of, uh, runway like they they don't uh, uh, until they they're actually in a playoff spot and have room themselves on montreal they don't have any breathing room and you know 
and until that's a thing that actually happens, you know, you have to be perfect, and the, there is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like, they don't have room to screw around. And, it, you know, it's absolutely vital that they both get the two points and that Montreal starts losing their games that they have to play. So Calgary's schedule's been changed here. We have pretty much eight games, and then we have four against Vancouver right at the end, starting on the 13th. It's the 13th, the 16th, the 18th, the 19th, because of uh, what's going on with Vancouver. Um, but, Matt, if the Flames are out, I think that you play eight games. I think you probably end it after the Ottawa game. But at that point, why even play the Ottawa game? Like, Do you think that the game on the 6th against Winnipeg couldn't end up being the last game of the season? It's one of those where, uh, like, I think that the regularly scheduled programming will happen. You, so you play out Ottawa on the 9th, and then the 13th, 16th, 18th, 19th against Vancouver. If both teams are out, why play them? Yeah, at that rate, you just run the draft lottery up point percentage because who cares, really? Like, it's... And if Vancouver's yeah. team is the ramshackle group that it's probably going to end up being, um, you know, AHL guys, taxi squad guys, Trevor Linden coming out of retirement, whoever's got skates and can play, um, I mean, Vancouver's probably not going to want to play those either. I guess him petitioning the league to just pack it in. Yeah. I don't know how their AHL team's looking, but I can't see them wanting to take a bunch of AHL guys if they're pl playing for the playoffs down there as well. Yeah. I know. It, it It's going to be odd, that's for sure. And, like, Calgary just needs to make those games against Vancouver actually happen. <laughs> you know, like, it, that's basically all that the Flames can do. Like, if they can win it on the 19th and sweep the three against Montreal and go 4-0 on the, on the homestand... At least that gives them a shot, you know, and at this we'll point, we're, at this point, but, I don't think we can look ahead to the whole week. We got to be game by game. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, get a win, reset, and then get the next win. Yeah. And it's like, oh, you got the win. Good for you. Okay. Figure out what we you, did you're, right you're, and then go do it you, again. You're, you're still behind. So you got to go win the next one. <laughs> yeah. You know, but I think yeah. that's that's where you're celebrating. We're even seeing this in the post game interviews, and the guys are celebrating the small things and they're looking at the things they do well. Yeah, and I think that's how you help motivate the team. Like you said, yeah, you got one win. You're still behind, but here's the things we did well. Let's go do those things again. Yeah, and oh, you didn't do these things well, so pick these up while you're doing that. So you know, and so on and so forth. It it's going to be a tough road for the Flames, like you know make no bones about it like the flames are going to have like this is nearly an impossible feat for them to make the postseason and the only benefit that with the situation that they're in is a they're playing montreal three times and b just the the strength of the schedule and the condensed nature for montreal and the non-condensed for calgary that's so Matt, pretty much the only benefits. And, you know, Calgary, like, if they're going to do it, they've got to earn it. And the results will be on the board. You know, they're in control of their own destiny in terms of what they put out. And, you know, the, if they're doing their thing, the chips fall where they may. So, Matt, I mean, we've talked about can the Flames do it. It's possible. What's your gut telling you right now? With 12 games left, are we in or are we out? Oh, I would be absolutely shocked, frankly, if the Flames actually are playing in the playoffs. And it's not like it would be a pleasant surprise, but like just the how hard it is to make up six points in 12 games when the other team also has two additional games like it it's very tough it's not impossible at all and that's why like the schedules are extremely conducive if that were to happen you would need the schedule set up basically as it is for that to happen but this is literally all on the flames like it, it, frankly 
because of the quality of the opponents that Montreal is going to face, they're going to lose probably four of the eight games at a minimum against Toronto and Edmonton, just because it, you know it, you can't. It's impossible to roll off seven or eight wins against those two teams, um, and you know, like so, like there is some runway. Like if you know Calgary beats them in those three games and they lose a minimum of four against the good teams like Montreal's starting to get into danger mode where you know like they'll have lost seven of their 14 and at a minimum and you know like if Calgary is doing their thing like it could be a literal run to the finish line and you know it's possible but, but Calgary but has to going do Going back thing. to the question, your gut is that Calgary's no. not going to make it. I think it'll be too little too late. I think the, the I agree. they'll I think they'll give it a good run. And I could even see them winning all three this week and then dropping that game on Monday next week, which will basically end the season. So yeah, I mean, you and I sort of had our, our eulogy for this season a few weeks ago, and I think that at this point, yes, it's possible. Likely, no, possible, yes. I think these guys are done. I think we know what this team is this year. I, I don't want them, and I know there's a lot of fans talking about tanking and all this. Play as hard as you can, get as close as you can, be professionals, and go out and play the game right up till the end. Um, but I think that at this point... It's gonna. It's if the Calgary Flames make it, I'll be very shocked. Yeah. Well, put it this way: if the Flames do make it, they are the team that nobody would actually want to play in the playoffs because they're coming in red hot, like winning thirteen or fourteen of their last seventeen games, like because that's what they would need to do in order to actually make the postseason. So, like you know, you're getting a red hot team. Like that's not who you want to face in the postseason. So, you know, but the Flames have to go and do it. And for years, we haven't seen it. But with how they played the last four, if they play that way, that's how you do it. Whether we got a, actually... we got a long we got a long way to go before we get there though so yeah let's like, uh, let's worry about us getting there before we talk about you know how dangerous we're going to be in the postseason. Oh no! I well, I'm just you know using historical comparisons. Like you know, usually the hot team coming in is the hard one to actually knock right, out. Right now, it's going to be how hot these guys are going to be on the AT in in May. Yeah. No, and exactly, and like, and also for like team people wanting the Flames to like tank it, um, the top four players in this draft are pretty much interchangeable in terms of overall talent they're all pretty good uh it's not like last year or the year before where like there was a clear one two guy that were like clearly better but like from five to about 14 there's a difference but it's negligible and like they're all kind of good and all kind of bad all in their own separate ways and so like everybody has their own positive and negatives so like if the flames are picking say sixth or 13th there's a difference but it's not a huge one so like yeah you know like intrinsically earlier is better but in this particular draft because of the weirdness of COVID you know you might get the best player in the draft at number 13 so like it's well and I haven't looked at this draft class and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking draft today we'll do that in the future but even if the Flames were to somehow get into the top three, there's really only so many NHL spots we have open at this point. You're not going to move a guy to bring your, you know, your top player in. So unless that guy's a right winger, I think, you know, having that position, I, I, this is going to sound silly, but doesn't do us a lot of good. Yeah. Uh, Let's say you uh, bring in a center. What do you do? You put him right on line one, and then you've got that guy in home second, Monaghan third. That doesn't work. Yeah, no. And you're not going to move a guy out just to bring your 18-year-old in. Like This is why the the teams that are bad need these guys because it anchors their core. We have a good enough core that unless you're you know, getting a, a right winger, I don't see where that guy fits in here. With yeah, any... well, like you look at the... I'm just going to run through the top five quickly. You have Matthew Bernier's first overall 
projected. He's a center and left winger. Well, one of the two spots that Calgary has four of centers and left wingers, so yeah. that, that's not really helpful. The fourth overall pick guy is another center left winger. In between them, the number two and three guys are Owen Power and Luke Hughes, two left-handed shooting defensemen. So literally all areas of strength for the Flames, and then Luke Wallstead at number five, who's a goalie. So, like, it, it's basically, like, even if we get a top player in this draft, it's not a guy that the Flames would need to rush into the NHL right away because we already have all of those type of guys in spades. Yeah, and, and I mean there might, and we'll talk about this as we get close, close to the draft. But when I hear that list, I think maybe there's a something to be said that if we did end up in the top four, of trading our way down, getting an extra asset, and getting the first available right winger. Yeah, well, that's uh, that would be um, either Fabian Lysel or Dylan Gunther, who are both like ninth and tenth ish rated. So basically, right around where the Flames are if the draft was today right around where the Flames would be picking. And I, and, and I would assume then, I, that... I don't think those guys become your savior on right wing. You're still going to need to go out and buy one. Yeah. And, like, even then, like, I, if the Flames were picking, say, eighth overall, like, there are other guys that, you know, I'd be hoping for one of the defensemen instead. <laughs> so... Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, we, we need some guys, but I think wherever we pick, first, 30th, wherever... I think we're looking at a guy that, you know, is maybe not going to turn pro right away and would be best for the Flames and where we are to get some AHL seasoning. Yeah, for sure. Like, I, I would be, unless the Flames pick first overall, which would be bizarre and nice, but not likely to happen, um, I, the odds of whomever playing in the NHL next season are zero, I think. Also, but. when you look at the guys we would have above any of those guys, not only on the NHL depth chart, but in our prospects with Zari... Peltier, like I, you know, I think that we've, I think defense is where we'll need to be, but the left and center, even there, the next guy up is probably not going to be this guy that we draft. Yeah, I agree. Well, Matt, I think we're done for the week. Do you want to take us out? Well, this week ahead, more than anything, it is vital for the flame season, and it will reveal basically everything on what this team is. And so, with fervor, go Flames go! Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.